So, it is my great pleasure to have Ruben Jakob here today, and he will talk about the generic convergence of the elastic energy flow, well, hard one. Go ahead. Right, so, yeah, so... so um, in this wonderful framework. And um, now, first of all, as in, in every talk about this topic, I uh, introduce the, the fundamental uh, mathematical objects. So first of all, um, it's uh, about the Wilmer functional. Um, so it is, as usually, I, classically I define it as um, integral over the square of uh, the mean curvature of an immersion so sorry, so here, uh, so, so this is this is the mean curvature of an of an um, arbitrary immersion from a fixed surface. So in this case, it will be a torus. Very Riemannian manifold M. functional, I have to add another term. And uh, this is the sectional curvature of the manifold M with respect to the uh, tangent plane uh, dfx, so, so the uh, applied to the, the tangent plane of the torus in, in a fixed point x. So first of all, you have a tangent space at in the same point x, of course, into the tangent space of the Riemannian manifold M uh, in, the, in the image point f of x. So, and, and, and I can compute the sectional curvature with respect to this uh, tangent space. Now, of course, this is quite a complicated expression in general. So, so, so that's why the Wilmer functional is, in general, quite a The structure of the Wilmer functional because I will either have m equal to the three-dimensional sphere or the three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space, and that's why this uh, this section of curvature is, e is either one or constantly zero. Uh, so these are simply numbers, and uh, in this case, and uh, now of course the mean curvature as usual is the trace of the Second fundamental form, so uh, classical, oh, classical um, definition, and and then, so I, I have al already used the the metric, of course, in order to trace. But this is also nothing special. It is simply the pullback of the of the met the metric of the uh, target space, so either three dimensional sphere or three dimensional Euclidean space pulled back via the, the immersion F. And what does it mean? It means exactly, exactly this here. So that, I mean that, that, I, that I measure um, two tangent uh, vectors which arise as partial derivatives of the, of the immersion F with the given metric in the, in the ambient space metric G I J the on the Taurus C um sorry this I want to have this L2 gradient flow with well, uh, that I've just introduced. But um, I think about 20 years ago, um, some mathematicians have started to, to complain about the fact that, 
that this flow is not conform conformally invariant anymore. So the Wilmer function itself for any immersion f, first of all, into R3 or S3, and for any Möbius transformation, which, is, which can be applied to f. So, so in this case, I, 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 I've invariance, uh, which is well known, but it is quite easy to understand that that this that this equation does not hold anymore. So I cannot I cannot simply apply a Möbius transformation to a flow line. So so of course I I, I talk about the flow. in order to get again. very easily. So um, now there are two possibilities. So, so either one, one is one this idea and one has to keep on working with with the Wilmer flow simply or it turns out that one can uh, correct this mistake in a canonical and, and simple way. And actually this is possible. And it really surprised me. So I can well remember the, how uh, Professor Schetzler that one only has to multiply the, the L2 gradient of the Wilmer functional with this, with this factor here, which is one over uh, the modulus to the fourth power of the trace-free part of the second fundamental form of, of, the, of the emergence F or FT, which I plug in into this, um, in, in, into the, um, first of all, existing equation. So simply multiply the right hand side with this factor here. Um, so and then I, I wrote out what, what wrote down what it really is here, this, this uh, L2 gradient of the Wilmer function, that's simply this, it's, it's this differential operator here. Um, now, so now we have a, again, a quasi linear, um, well, no, no, first of all, uh, whose term is more or less the Beltran of the of the moving t uh, plus some lower order term and then multiplied with the with with this dangerous factor here i mean i say dangerous because it this could become singular here so of course i i have to assume that And in, in order to have a well-defined flow, uh, and it's it's exactly this um, obstruction or this condition which forces me to restrict this flow. I mean, so this this new flow, this uh, Möbius invariant Wilmer flow, how I call it. An immersion which maps a closed surface into R3, for example, with a property that the second fundamental form does not vanish. And in, in every point, uh, this condition implies about tori all the time in, in, the, in the discussion of this flow. But now, as I told you, so this uh, this 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 flow has the uh, property to be conformally invariant. So this is exactly what I wrote down here. So it it, it means exactly 
if you have a if you have a flow line, so sorry, can I? Then any application of uh, of a Möbius transformation to this flow line will again be a solution of this equation. Okay, it's not, now now the question is of course why why does it why does it really help me? Why, why is it so interesting? And um, now the conformal invariance of this flow um, can ex especially be used in order to map the all all the flow lines of this flow simultaneously from R3 into S3, simply because the stereographic projection and also its inverse are conformal maps. And I can do this without changing the flow equation. So of course, I mean, I can always map flow lines of a geometric flow with a different morphism, for example, into another space, but uh, this is not a very smart idea in general because I will, I will not um, obtain solutions of, of, the, of the same equation, or probably the, the equation doesn't, doesn't make any sense any, anymore. But in, but in this case, uh, I, I, I map solutions of a, of a certain differential equation again into solutions of exactly the same differential equation. Now, th this is in fact very useful because it, it's it, in in some in some situations it turns out to be easier to investigate the Möbius and Bernd Wilmer flow in the three sphere than in R three. It's not always easier, but at least I have these two possibilities and I can uh, with this uh, kind of freedom that I did not have for the classical um, Wilmer flow. Now, so how do, how do I use it? So I, I'm talking here about a surprising use of the hop vibration. So at least for, for me, it was surprising. So first of all, I defined the hop vibration. So it is a map from the quaternions to the quaternions. And uh, I consider S3 as a subset of, of the quaternions and, and also S2 as a, as, a sub, as a subset of the quaternions. And uh, there is a very simple definition for the hop vibration. It's simply a quadratic form, so which is just defined like that. I, I take some quaternion and Q with components Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q4 and then I, I apply one reflection to the, to the second component and I multiply these, then this reflected uh, quaternion again to the, to the quaternion itself and then I, I actually obtain the hop vibration. Uh, so with all the properties that one has classically known about the hop vibration if, if one also uses another definition and um, now by, by some coincidence actually I, I found out about one and a half years ago that the Hoff vibration has the has the property to map flow lines of the Möbius invariant Wilmore flow onto flow lines of of a very simple flow which moves curves so, I, so first of all, one has to understand that the Hopf vibration. The, oh, sorry, what's, what happens here? The the Hopf vibration does not have, does not, is not a diffeomorphism. Of course, it uh, it cancels one dimension. So it is a map from a three-dimensional manifold to a two-dimensional manifold, and it. Now that so that means that the fibers are one-dimensional. So every point in S two has a has fiber um, diffeomorphic to, uh, I mean, has fiber exactly a great circle. And um, that this means that a closed curve in S2 um, 
becomes a torus in S3 if I take the pre-image via the Hopf vibration. So that's why closed curves in S2 correspond to a certain type of tori in the, in the three sphere. So I simply by, by taking the pre-image via the Hopf vibration. So that's why it, 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 it can be possible, in fact, that uh, Hopf vibration has the, has the property to, to map a flow which moves surfaces into a flow which moves curves. It could be possible. But of course, it, it does not, first of all, it, it, it does not seem to be true. One, one simply one would not believe that this is true. But then I started to, to compute, uh, to make the, the, the necessary computations in order to check if this is true or not. And it's, it turned out to be true. And, and this is exactly the result. So that, uh, so, so here, here on, in, this, in this picture, I, I exactly start to explain how, I, how one has to do the, uh, the computation. Um, so the, so I, the problem is that if I simply map a surface with a hop vibration, then I will not get a parameterization of a curve because the, the, the domain of, of, of the surface will, will still be two-dimensional. But I want to have I want to have something which is which is uh, parameterized on S1. So that's why I I, I somehow have to um, I have to get back to a to a to a one uh, to a one-dimensional manifold. And of course, the the usual mathematical technique in order to to do this is to use lifts. So I I simply work, clarified for myself that that for every immersion, for every smooth, smooth immersion F from, from a torus into S3, S3, for a given curve gamma, there exists infinitely many horizontal lifts from S1 into the torus such that this diagram commutes. So the, the gamma is given, a given, uh, um, closed curve in S2 and the immersion F is given and I can always arrange uh, I mean I can prove the, the existence of of locally defined lifts into the into the torus sigma such that this this composition is exactly the curve gamma and um, and horizontal means that uh, that the lift um, crosses fibers of, of, this, of this composition um, perpendicularly or, or vertically. So this is, this is really important in order, in order to, to get exactly this, this flow equation. So I can, I can, I can um, explain this um, even a little bit more, more carefully. So here you, here you see exactly what I, what I what one has to do you know, in order to, uh, to make this computation. So one, one fixes a small arc on S1, and then one maps this, this arc into the, into the given torus sigma, in, in, as I explained, in such a way that, that, this, that this composition here gives me exactly the, the map gamma. So this is exactly, an arc of, of, of the curve gamma. So, then, so this, this, uh, this equation, oh wait, sorry. so this, this, uh, this, this, this equation um, holds point-wise in every point x on the, on, on, on the unit sphere, uh, I mean on the, on the unit circle, and uh, it doesn't matter that these arcs are are pretty small because I can I can cover the, the S1 by finitely many arcs and then I uh, then I get uh, the 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 entire curve gamma in terms of these lifts. Now, um, using using these lifts, I exactly proved this this equation here. So because if, if I can, I understood that if I can prove that the differential of the Hopf vibration maps my 
differential operator, which is the L2 gradient of the Wilmer functional multiplied with, uh, with the uh, one over trace three part of the, of, the, uh, of the immersion to the fourth power onto exactly this, this differential operator, which, uh, which is applied to, to curves. And of course, using these lifts now in, in order to, to make this equation really be possible, then th then I have exactly the this what I the um, so it doesn't work. It then I then I have exactly this result what I what I have just uh, announced that that flow lines flow lines of the Möbius invariant Wilmer flow are mapped onto flow lines of this of this flow, uh, and and so finally this this is a statement about about the action of the differential of the Hopf vibration applied to the differential operator of the Möbius invariant Wilmer flow. So this, this, there has to be some interesting result and it's, it's exactly this, this differential operator, but now um, moving curves. Okay, so this, this I found out and I was, I was very happy about it because I immediately understood that, that this gives me a, a descent or a reduction from the quite complicated Möbius and Wilmer flow to a seemingly much simpler flow. So I call it the, the elastic energy flow, EEF. Um, now, so why, why is it so wonderful? I mean, this elastic energy flow has already been uh, investigated in, in the last 20 years. Uh, first of all, um, by uh, Kuvert, Jok Schätzle, and then later by um, Mrs. Uh, Dal Akwa, and, uh, and and then um, of course parallelly by a lot of other um, mathematicians in in the in the last ten years, and uh, so in different of course in in different settings in different um, uh, in different ambient spaces, but it, especially uh, Mrs. Dal Akwa has investigated this flow on the on the two sphere so on a on the on the round sphere with with constant curvature uh, sectional curvature one so, so this of course this fr from a theoretical point of view that, that was an interesting project on its own sake but um but but now it turned out to be especially fruitful for me because i can i could immediately take all this amount of work uh, without having to think about it uh, my, my myself and I could immediately deduce. Okay, this this flow, the elastic energy flow, has the the property to have global flow lines, um, starting from from an arbitrary closed smooth curve. So th this is of course this is quite a, a particular property of of this flow. I mean you cannot. Uh, you cannot expect from, from any flow on curves th that that it that it has uh, global flow lines. So this this really surprised me. And secondly, um, at least reparameterizations of of this flow um, always subconverges. So th so these global flow lines always have to have to subconverge to a smooth limit, which is a, of course then a critical point of the elastic energy on the two sphere. And um, now, of course, this has something to do with the, with the geometry of the sphere, but okay, in any case, I, I could simply believe it and, and uh, use it now, but, and I could, I could take back this information from the two sphere to the, to the three sphere for the Möbius and Verne Wilmer flow. So this is what I wrote down here. I get global existence and subconvergence of, those, of all those flow lines of the Möbius and Verne Wilmer flow, which start in a, in a parameterization uh, of of a Hopf torus, so of the of a pre-image, of a pre-image of, of of any of any closed curve. If I if I start in such a in such an immersion, then I have global flow lines which which also subconverge uh, in in S three. So so this is so th and these are the are the pictures here that I simply uh, that that I quickly uh, scanned. Uh, only in order to give you an, uh, a feeling for for the 
uh, for the shape of, of Hofta, right? So, uh, so if you, if you start with such a simple curve in, in S2, then, then, then actually the Hofthorus looks already quite complicated. And if, you, if the curve becomes only a little bit more, more complex in S2, then, then, then the pre-image is, uh, is um, yeah, be, becomes, becomes more and more uh, fascinating and, um, and surprisingly complicated. Um, and of course, so this is this is the symmetric Clifford torus. So this is not so interesting, but uh, but actually, I I will prove. I will, I, I proved only some months later after after I've already deduced this information that every flow line of this of the Möbius and Van Wilmer flow converges fully and smoothly exactly to the Clifford torus, only if the initial immersion has, has an energy which is smaller than a certain number, which I, which I could somehow compute. So, um, now, so, so first of all, um, what is, sorry, what's, what's happening? Uh, first of all, such a result is, is, is not, Absolutely surprising. I mean, um, I, I was certainly influenced by uh, Kuvert and Schätzle's result uh, from from 2004 that uh, that the classical Wilmer flow has the property to to drive um, uh, spherical immersion, so immersions from a sphere into R3. Into into the round sphere, as time goes to infinity, and this and this convergence convergence is full and smooth, and uh, so I mean this is probably one of the uh, of the most um, of the most famous uh, results about the Wilmer flow, and it, but but they needed also an energy threshold, and they they proved okay we this is certainly true if the if the if the initial energy is smaller than eight pi. Now here the situation is of course is of course different because I'm not talking about immersions from the sphere into R3, for example, but from tori into R3 or into S3. On the on the one hand and on the other hand, I have only talked about uh, initial immersions which map the the torus sigma onto a Hopf torus. So th this is only a a, sub a subclass of, of, of all tori. So this, of course, this is quite a uh, strong condition. Um, and that's why one, one could expect that, uh, that I can prove such a, such a theorem with a slightly bigger threshold than eight pi. And this actually turned out to be true because uh, this number here, eight, um, eight times the square root of, uh, uh, pi to the three divided by three is is a little bit bigger than eight pi, and uh, and actually I, I got this number here in, in a totally different way than than Schätzle and Kuvert. I mean, uh, the, the the eight pi in in Schätzle's and and Kuvert's result come uh, from uh, from the from from the um, what was it? Um, uh, from 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 the from this uh, density from this uh, from the estimation of 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 the um, uh, pre images of of an immersion in terms of the of the Wilmer functional. So um, Yao and Lee have uh, have proved in the 80s that um, an, an arbitrary immersion um, with with Wilmer energy smaller than than um, than eight pi, can can only have can, has to has to be an embedding because it can only have one pre-image over every image point, and um, so, so so from from this Li Yao inequality, um, you get the eight pi, but here you don't you don't need any Li Yao inequality. So, so in this case, this uh, this threshold comes from uh, the comp from my computation of 
of an of an energy gap between the lowest energy of the actually of the of the elastic uh, energy functional which is 2 pi and then the next energy level so first there has to be some gap be between between 2 pi and and the next higher um, critical critical value of the elastic energy but what is this number and of course then then you have to you have to get a deep understanding of the um, of the Euler Lagrange equation of the elastic energy. So simply of the equation L2 gradient of the en elastic energy of some curve equals zero. So the stationary equation. This 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 has to be somehow re Reform, uh, reformulated or rephrased in, into another differential equations e equation which should be um, completely integrable and then and this is actually true this is uh, this was al already an observation by uh, Singer and Langer in the 80s and then you get to um, to an equation actually for 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 elli elliptic curves uh, in in CP2 and and so, so one one gets into a totally different field of mathematics and and then exploiting information about elliptic curves one 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 gets back with a with a formula for for the critical values of the elastic energy and and this is actually nicely published by by Lynn Heller so that, so I did not so again <laughs> I did not have to work this out on my own and which is which is actually not not so not so easy uh, so i could i could simply take this information from from lynn heller's paper and, uh, and and then compute this energy gap but now the next theorem oh sorry the next theorem what i actually want to talk about for the for the rest of the talk is much much deeper so it, i want to prove and I, I say I have already proved that the same conclusion holds without any conditions, but of course only generically. So, so I say for every in, in every. So first of all, I fix I fix again a Hopfschauer's immersion, and then I say in every C four alpha neighborhood U of of this fixed immersion, there is another immersion of which is again a Hopf torus immersion, so which maps the, the torus sigma onto Hopf torus in S3 in this neighborhood, such that the flow line which starts in this in this new immersion uh, F0 twiddle. Converges smoothly and fully again to the Clifford torus. So I have the same conclusion as above, but without any energy threshold. And of course, I, I, the, the the optimal result would be to prove this generically, uh, because I mean it, it cannot hold for for every start uh, immersion because there there are there are infinitely many critical values of of the Wilmer functional, or Equivalently of the of the elastic energy, and and start in a in a critical point of the Wilmer functional, then then the flow line does not move anywhere. But uh, but the, the theorem says that okay, if if I am in such a bad situation, so perhaps I can yes I can I can show it here. If if I am in such a bad situation, then I can perturb a little bit the the initial the initial value, and I. And on this perturbed flow line, I will I will move down down with the, with the energy much lower than uh, than the than the limit of of the original flow line. So so I will explain this here carefully. So first of all, because of this correspondence between the Wilmer functional and the and the elastic energy. I, I don't talk about the Wilmer functional anymore, and I don't talk about the the, the Möbius invariant Möbius invariant Wilmer flow anymore. Now I, I only concentrate on the flow equation on, on on curves. 
Now, suppose you, you are in such a bad situation that, that, that you have an initial curve gamma twiddle such that the flow line which, which gets out of gamma twiddle simply moves into a critical point of the, of the elastic energy with energy bigger than two pi. I mean, this is, of course, it is possible. This cannot be ruled out. So th then the question is, okay, can I really perturb this initial, in, initial curve in such a way that, that gamma twiddle plus some psi, so this is again a curve on, on S2. Um, I mean, after projection with the exponential map and so on, uh, can, I, can I arrange a slight modification of the initial value such that the new flow line will deviate from the given flow line after a very large time in exponentially fast, or at least that fast that, that it is enough to prove that the energy will go down. I mean, lower than, than, the, than, the, than, this, than the energy of, 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 of uh, this curve gamma star. So this is, so this, uh, this I wrote down here. So on, on, the, on, 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 the, on, the, on the left flow line, the, the energy goes down onto a, uh, in, into a certain big energy level. I mean, quite much bigger than two pi. And now on the, on, the, on the perturb curve, I want to prove that the energy uh, get, gets down to a, to a lower value. Now, if one tries to, to, to prove this, then, then one, one actually sees that it is really necessary to prove even much more, namely, well, namely that, that the, why, I mean, the, an appropriately perturbed flow line starting in gamma twiddle plus psi has, a, has quite a fast deviation from the given flow line that goes into gamma star after a large time. And of course, this computation is, is really, really hard to do. But in order to get only in, into the game, one has to get some control about, about all flow lines that start in this neighborhood. So, I, I, so I, have to, I have to understand what the evolution operator of the elastic energy flow equation, what properties the, the evolution operator has. So it, it does not suffice anymore to, to consider only one flow line and to investigate one flow line, for example, its smoothness or that it's real analytic and so on. I mean, this is, or the, this is good to know, but it, it will not suffice in order to prove such a theorem. I really have to understand, okay, when I, under, when I, when I start in a small neighborhood of a given curve gamma, gamma twiddle, uh, in, 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 which, in which space do all these flow lines live? And of course, I mean, there are spaces which model such a situation, for example, uh, parabolic Hölder spaces, and uh, so now, now, now I, I, I get into a, into a much more technical part of the talk because I, I, I didn't only want to give ideas. I mean, um, so I, I'm forced to look at the, at the leading term of, of, the, of the differential operator that, that, is, uh, that drives the, um, Elastic energy flow, and this is so. This is simply this uh, this uh, operator. So this is uh, the the gradient or the the, the nabla of, of of the curvature of, of the of, of, of any fixed curve gamma um, twice. So second derivatives, and then so nabla simply means okay, you take you take two derivatives of the of the uh, curvature of gamma um, divided by, by, the, by the speed of the curve. And then you project it onto the tangent uh, plane of, um, of S2 in, in every point. So this is simply the gamma. And the perp means that, you, that after that, you, after every, each differentiation, you project onto the normal space of the, of the curve. So that's why it's, <laughs> 
it's it's quite a complicated differential operator, but it is a differential operator, and it's exactly so. It, it is exactly the oper the operator that I have to investigate because it it corresponds to the to the L two gradient of the elastic energy. Now, what happens if I if I if I if I simply do this differentiation? So, I mean, what is the curvature itself? It is second derivative of of the curve gamma, but of course, uh, so. I, uh, normalized by the speed of the curve, so this is this is not not really a partial uh, derivative. It is a bit more complicated, but okay. So first of all, it's this expression, and then I have to subtract the projection onto the the normal on uh, in, in point wise on uh, of of s two. So in every point of the curve. I have the tangents place, the, or the tangent plane, and the normal, uh, the normal vector. And of course, I have to subtract the, the projection onto the normal vector um, because um, uh, just what I what I explained, I uh, the the the, the, um, the curvature of of a curve gamma in S two has to be a section into the tangent bundle of S2. So that's why this is, this is the right expression for the curvature in S2. So, I mean, it's not a Euclidean curvature. And now this term really gives me quite a lot of trouble because if I now go on different, differentiating, then I get fourth derivative of gamma, which, which is fine, first of all, this is, more or less parabolic, I mean elliptic, but of course, this this term here produces, for example, this term, and it destroys me. It destroys the, the ellipticity of of this operator completely. So of course, I, I get a lot of other uh, annoying terms. For example, this one here. So this is the projection of the of the fourth derivative. On, onto the tangent of the of the curve gamma, but this term is not so bad because I this I can I could smart out with the Turk's trick. So we have already seen the Turk's trick in, in Peter Topping's talk and also in Miles Simon's talk, and now here of course we, we see it again, but it actually doesn't help because this term here I would I would never cancel, and um, so that's why I will never be able. To, to construct an evolution operator which maps into a parabolic Halder space using parabolic Schauder theory if I, if, I, if I start working with this differential operator yeah, because it, it, does, it, it does not fit into the uh, theory of, of, um, of parabolic equations. So, so what is, uh, and, and also the Turk's trick does not help me in this situation. So what is the way out? And, uh, and, and now this is, this is the last part of the talk. So, so I, 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 wanted, I want to show you how I use this correspondence between the Möbius invariant Wilmer flow and the elastic energy flow in the, in the other direction in order to solve this, this problem. I mean, so far I've, I've used this correspondence only in, in the classical, sense of a descent so i which means i i i used information about the simpler flow about the elastic energy flow in order to get new information about the much more difficult flow which is the mirrors of and wilmer flow and this was logically totally clear but now i do it exactly the other way around and uh, and and uh, so why do I do this? Um, now, first of all, the the L two gradient of the of the Wilmer functional is is not uniformly elliptic neither. So, also this operator gives me quite quite a big trouble. But if I consider this flow in R three and not in S three, then then it is it is not so difficult to to see that okay i can simply try uh, apply the turk's trick so i can explicitly write down 
uh, a differential operator, globally defined differential operator, um, which points into, into, the, into the tangent plane of the, of the immersion F, in, evaluated in an arbitrary immersion F, such that the sum of, of, the, of the L2 gradient of the Wilmer flow and, and this, and this uh, tangential uh, um, vector field uh, T of F gives me a uniformly elliptic differential operate this is this is exactly what I wrote down here so if you do this uh, computation in this uh, in this situation then you see the result I mean if, if you choose this this T exactly in the right way then you see oh the result is such an uh, is such a differential operator so two nublas which which still depend on on the on the on the immersion F that I plug in but but uh, but two fixed Matrix or two two fixed immersions with respect to, to which I, I take the the nabla and this is this is actually uniformly elliptic so the metric I don't change and this does not really bother me the rest is of lower order and um so now now this is quite an old trick first of all it's simply the Turk trick but the, the the funny point in this in this situation is that I know already what is this? I know already that there exist global flow lines of, of the um, Möbius invariant Wilmer flow. And that's why also of this uh, slightly modified Möbius invariant Wilmer flow, uh, because this is only reparameterization. This is, this is not so complicated. What, what happens uh, if, I, if, I, if I add this differential operator T? So I, I know I have global flow lines if I start in a, in a Hopf-Torus immersion. So that's why I'm in a, in a much better situation than I have been some years ago when I, when I try to prove short time existence of the Möbius and Wilmer flow, because at that point of, of the state of the art, I, I, could, I, I, I could only argue with, with the initial immersion and, and, and try to prove that in a, in a small, small neighborhood of, of, of an fixed initial immersion, there is, a, there is for a very short time a solution of the Möbius invariant Wilmer flow. But now I'm in a much better situation. Now I, I know I have a global flow line and I can simply go on considering a small neighborhood of the entire flow line uh, in, uh, in R3. And, and I take this neighborhood in a parabolic um, Hölder space and then I, then it's very simple to see that that the the differential operator of of this flow maps this neighborhood, this tubular neighborhood of this flow line, into into C four, into into C alpha alpha over four, in as as a C one operator. So this is I mean this is this is totally clear from the computations that I that I made in my in my first paper about about the Möbius and Bernard Wilmer flow. In which I proved the short time existence. So this is this is exactly the same computation, and and then I again, as in my as in this paper from 2017, I can compute the Frechet derivative of this C1 operator and apply it to um, to 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 the space of of such. C4 plus alpha one plus alpha over four um, tangent functions uh, which are exactly zero at time zero. And um, so this is, in a way, this is, uh, this is the tangent space uh, at, the at the flow line. If, 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 if I would consist uh, the, the flow line not, not, to, not to move at time zero, so this is yeah. So so this is in any case, um, if I if I restrict the Frechet derivative to to this to this space, then I get an isomorphism. So this this I have simply proved. And now the the funny point is that only by considering a slightly more complicated map, namely a map which maps the flow the a given flow line 
onto our, uh, uh, not only a flow line, uh, an, an, an arbitrary element of, of this space here, C4 plus alpha, one plus alpha over four, to the, to the initial uh, immersion and to the, uh, to the effect of the differential operator to the immersion in the, in the, in the second component, then, then this, this differential operator will be a local diffeomorphism. And it's and it, actually this is all this is this is very simple. This is only true because I can prove that. Oh, sorry, what happens here? So this is my. So my. Can you see? I don't know what my computer is doing, but uh, can see. I I don't know. I sorry. I don't know what my computer is doing. Uh, in any case, so now now I can I can go on. So to prove that 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 this that this product map, which is defined on the on the neighborhood of the flow line into into the space C four alpha of um, of uh, of start immersions, and and then um, into um, into C into uh, sorry here I made a mistake it is, it is this year C alpha alpha over four this is this is the so, the, the, so this is this is wrong here um, so in so the product of this space with with this space here um, has to be a diffeomorphism only because I can prove that that the Frechet derivative of of this of this differential operator is an isomorphism on on this uh, on this tangent space here. So the space of all uh, of all uh, perturbations which are zero at time zero, and th actually this is a very uh, it's a very general result. I mean, this is a very old idea. It it's, uh, it's, uh, goes back to uh, Antrenant and um, I, I think Angenon was one of the first who considered this product map. But then later one could also see it um, in, in papers by Martinazzi uh, and, po and, and Polden. So, so I, I, was, I was not the first one to, to consider this map, but the interesting thing is that now I can I can consider the inverse of this map psi, and um, so uh, psi. I say psi especially maps a small ball about the given flow line, diffeomorphically onto a neighborhood of of the of the image with respect to psi, and this is simply the the the, the start immersion f comma zero because. Because it is a flow line, so so I have evaluation zero. So this this special point in this product in this product space has an has a pre-image via psi, and but this pre-image is is taken by a diffeomorphism. So that's why I I get I get back the the the, the flow lines which emerge out of of. Uh, the the start immersions f, but not only in the fixed start immersion f star, but in any in any start immersion f, in a in a small neighborhood of of this fixed immersion f star in in the space c four alpha, where's in this space c four alpha. So of course this holds only on a, on a very small neighborhood of of the fixed uh, immersion f star but it but it, it's actually true i mean this is exactly what i proved it's it's a local diffeomorphism so i get the flow lines via this construction and i know immediately that the that the evolution operator is a c1 operator because the inverse of a c1 operator is again a c1 operator so that's why the this shows how how one gets um a c1 evolution operator by means of parabolic Schauder theory, if one is able to uh, to apply the Turk strict to the ev geometric evolution equation in such a way that uh, that the evolution equation becomes uniformly parabolic. 
So in this case, in this sense, this is quite classical what I did. And uh, it, obviously this works only in, in the linear space. So uh, the, the Möbius and Verhoeven Wilmer flow perhaps has a, has a very complicated right hand side, but it, it, is, it is well defined as a flow in R3 and it, everything works out uh, greatly. So I get these, I get my flow lines uh, P um, as, as a result of this, of the, of the inverse of this map. So, so this is, so that's why as C1, uh, C, uh, I mean, as flow lines, which depend in the C1 way on the, on the initial immersion F. And on the other hand, I know that these are, that, that, that every fixed flow line is a reparameterization of a, of a solution of the original Möbius and Werner Wilmer flow. So that's why I have not constructed some, some nonsense. It's exactly the same flow that, that I've described now. So if you, if you would look at, at the flow line in terms of a computer simulation, you would not see any change. But, but, but these, these flow lines are parameterized differently. Now, you can immediately throw this result onto S3 via the stereographic projection. And because of the conformal invariance of the Möbius and Werner Wilmer flow, I will again obtain something which makes sense, namely again a C1 evolution operator from, from the same small neighborhood of a fixed immersion F star into the same space. But, but now it's, uh, I have to change the, the dimension, but it doesn't matter. It, it, it maps into a parabolic Hölder space, which, which, is a very, which has a very strong norm. So this is a very, a very strong result actually. And, and this flow line, I mean, this evolution operator, I, I can now map onto the S2 via the discussed descent. So I have exactly the same flow equation that I have that what is that I've just uh, talked about. I mean, so so 15 minutes ago, nothing has changed. Um, I only have to I have only modified the, equa the equation a little bit by by adding a, such a tangential differential operator, which which can also be notated as in, in this in this. Uh, in this way, and um, and now I, I map the the hop vibration to this evolution operator, and I get an evolution operator for the elastic energy flow equation. Um, but of course, now now this is th this in, this entire construction is, is is very is very technical. So actually, one one first I first using this this descent method, I, I first of all I only get a C zero evolution operator in a much in a much much worse space so not in a in a herder space so only c c0 of of this here so so much 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 worse but then this this can be improved and and actually the 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 decisive trick in order to to improving this this technique is is to accept that okay first of all i, I only have a c0 evolution operator for the elastic energy flow on the two sphere. And I, I cannot prove C1 regularity immediately, but then I, again, I, I make a, I, I, I apply a new trick. So if I, if I want to prove C1 regularity of an evolution operator, for example, then I simply guess what the, what the correct Frechet derivative could be and prove that this guess is correct. And at the same time, I prove that not only that the guess is correct, but that the Frechet derivative is actually continuous as a, as a certain, as an operator bet between uh, appropriately chosen spaces. So this is, uh, I mean, this is an old trick in, in order to prove C1 regularity of an operator, in fact, that first of all, you, you prove only C1 regularity of an operator. And if you want to prove, C, uh, uh, first of all, you want to prove, you can prove C0, regularity of an evolution operator so that that the evolution or I mean of any operator uh, that you want to investigate so that it is continuous at least between two two Banach spaces and if you insist on having to prove C1 regularity then you only guess what the Frechet derivative is but of course the guess has to be correct 
and then then you and then you prove really by hand by 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 definition of a Fréchet derivative that that this guess was correct, and and this already gives you the the continuity, um, and and actually in this case, one the the guess is that the Fréchet derivative of the evolution operator is the unique solution of a linear of a linear equation. So of course this is the usual linearization business. So I take my my differential operator of, of the elastic energy flow, which is now a little bit a little bit modified, of course. And I simply I know that this is a C1 operator, so I can take the Frechet derivative. So this makes sense. And now I want to know, okay, what is what is the solution of this linear equation here? So and um, and actually, of course, I mean, if you are somehow experienced with, with such problems, then you know, okay, of course, the, 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 the solution of this equation, if, if, if there is a unique solution, then the solution of this equation will exactly be the, the Frechet derivative of the, of the evolution equation, uh, of the, <laughs> the Frechet derivative of the evolution operator. Uh, of the of the original equation, so so you start with a with a differential operator, you have the flow for which is driven by this differential operator. This is this I call E, and and now if I want to know okay what is what is the Frechet derivative of the evolution evolution operator, then I only have to check if uh, if the linearized equation has unique solutions, U T, and this will be exactly exactly this uh, this Frechet derivative and um, yeah and so 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 in this case I I, I was successful um, proving the, the the existence of a of, of a C1 evolution operator e for the for the elastic energy flow and um, and of course so sorry I just see I here I have forgotten to to say that I evaluate I evaluate this in the flow line. So this so this is missing here. So so this this entire Frechet derivative is evaluated in the flow line and then applied to to a solution that 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 that, that I want to figure out what it is and it, and it, and it is exactly this Frechet derivative. Now. This this was actually the, the first really technical and 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 difficult step, in which uh, which which can only work out because I know that th that this that this Frechet derivative here of the, of the of the given differential operator is is sectorial, because then I can use uh, semi group theory, and um, uh, instead of parabolic uh, Schauder theory, and and the, the semi group theory still gives me. Uh, estimates which are sufficiently good uh, in 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 order to prove that that the Frechet derivative derivative is actually continuous as an operator between uh, appropriate uh, spaces. I mean, of course, these the spaces have to be chosen appropriately. But uh, uh, in any case, in in any case, I um, so so this this worked out, and but it was a huge amount of work. And now after this. This big, big, yeah, right. So we have to stop, right? So, I, so I only stop it now in uh, saying that after this, after this big obstruction was uh, was overcome, I the the theory becomes uh, becomes easier because become becomes simpler to um, to develop because it is not so difficult anymore to, to prove that these different, these, that these Frechet derivatives of the evolution operator are injective at every point of time and also have dense image in the, in the range in the, in, I mean, have dense range in the, in the ambient space. And, uh, and this is, this is the crucial point in order to, in order to get into the proof of this generic full convergence result that, that I, that I presented. So, this is this is this is really the crucial point. Can can you prove that the Frechet derivative of of the elastic energy flow along a given flow line has dense has dense range at every point of time? Uh, so if this would not be true, then one could not prove the theorem. Okay. So in any case, um, so I 
I stop here, okay? And um, so I, I didn't see any questions. So I, I, I seem to have been clear, clear all the time, right away. But I can't, I cannot see anybody now. I mean, uh, well, uh, thank you for, for your talk. Uh, so are you, are now, you still alive? I mean, I don't know if I ask. I think most people are still alive. Um, are there any questions? Or remarks, comments? So let's see. So maybe I start with a question, I, well, maybe a naive question. So you said you like that this thing is like a Möbius invariant. Um, is there any reasonable, so you go into R3, so co-dimension one, is there anything like reasonable doing this in co-dimension larger than one? Oh, um, oh, oh, so, so you want to, you, you, oh, so you want to, you, you want to uh, investigate the, the Möbius invariant Wilmer flow in, in, in bigger co-dimension. I want to know if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I can remember there, somebody else has already asked this question after one of my, of my first talks about this topic. And I remember that I, that, that I answered immediately that this, um, that this will, that this would not work out. Um, um, well, I mean, you know, uh, of course, first of all, I mean, you only ask if it, if it makes sense. I mean, of course, you can, you, you can define, you, you, you can define, uh, I mean, you, you can even compute the, the, uh, the, um, the L2 gradient of the, of the Wilmer energy for emergence, uh, emergence which map uh, a given surface, uh, of course, into, into R4. But, but then the, but, but the right-hand side um, becomes, becomes more cumbersome if you, have, if you have, for example, two or three uh, normal vectors and not, not only one normal vector. Because if you have, if you have only one normal vector, so I mean, code I mentioned one, then, then, this, then the, the lower order term of the, of the, of the uh, L2 gradient of the Wilmer functional uh, is is very simple. It's only the square of the of the trace free part of the um, uh, of, of the f second fundamental form of the immersion times uh, the mean curvature, which is which is only which is a which is a vector which uh, which points into a one dimensional bundle, and uh, and the, and it's really really helpful to know this. I really I use this heavily in order to work out this de this descent or this reduction so if i would not know this i couldn't have made any computation and that's why the the, the entire reduction only works from a flow with which moves through r3 into a um, i mean a flow which moves through s3 to s2 but not in higher dimensions so otherwise the computations be become much 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 too complicated i i think but uh, yeah, so but but uh, but it, it makes sense. Yeah, of course it makes sense to to consider the flow in higher co-dimension. But the question is, uh, do you have the tech the technical ability to to prove anything about this flow? I mean, I I don't know. You know, I mean, th this is you you w one could, you can you can you could really lose such a game. You know. Yeah, I understand. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Remarks, comments, jokes, or similar. You can ask everything. Okay, if that's not the case, let's thank Ruben again.